Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to BCB Main Stage. Uh, next topic we have is Global Shift, Climate Change in the Bar World, and is presented by Maggie Campbell and Paul Clark. Climate change is undoubtedly the greatest threat to humanity today. But beyond ditching plastic straws, what can we as an industry really do about it? Author and editor Paul Clark and distiller and educator Maggie Campbell explore the ways that distillers, bar owners, and the beverage media are each confronting the challenge from production and operating processes to public engagement and active involvement in changing public policy. Let's give a warm welcome to Maggie Campbell and Paul Clark. Thank you very much. Um, so we just want to say thanks for coming out for this on, on what is in the middle of all of the fun and excitement of Bar Convent to talk about something extremely not fun uh, <laughs> of, of global climate change. Uh, Maggie and I have been talking about this for a long time. And actually, we have a third presenter who is not here on stage, um, Ivy Mix from Leanda in Brooklyn. Uh, she had been planning to come over, but it was unable, unable to come to, unfortunately. But we have a great deal of information from her as well to include the bar side of things. Um, because we wanted to, to dive in into talking about climate change and the bar industry and spirits production for one obvious reason. Climate change is real and it's going to affect pretty much every aspect of our lives, personal and professional. Um, and when we look at the drinks world and why we're talking about this now, um, let's try to wrap our heads around what's happening with the world and what's happening to our drinks. Um, all of us in this room, in some way, make our living from beverage alcohol. Uh, whether you produce it, whether you sell it, you import it, you ship it, you write about it, um, all of our incomes all of our livelihoods are affected by this. Um, so we need to look at the ways that climate change affects our world in this way, but also look at the ways that we can affect it in the long run. So what we're going to do is going to take a couple of case studies really quickly, the, the margarita and the Manhattan, and looking at ways that climate change can affect the future of these cocktails just to kind of process that. So um, the future of our margaritas is really tied to the future of Mexico. When you think about margarita, Margaret is three things, right? Tequila, triple sec, and lime juice. Well, let's start with the limes, okay? Um, limes are grown on trees that flourish in tropical and subtropical climates, but the climate reality is, since the 1960s, Mexico has gotten warmer. By the end of the century, northern Mexico could see its average annual temperatures rise by between three and four degrees Celsius. Uh, and in 2011, Mexico had what was described as its worst drought on record, uh, with uh, one, more than 1.7 million cattle dying of starvation at first, and at least 2.2 million acres of crops uh, wither, withered across at least five states. In the long run, climate change may lead to a 40 to 70% decline in Mexico's current cropland suitability by 2030. Uh, and this could soar to an 80 to 100% decline by the end of this century. So in the long run, lime trees require lots of sun and water. Sun, we're going to always have an ample supply, but by the end of the century, there will be not be enough water in Mexico. And with that, with that lack, of, lack of water, there will no be, more, be no more limes uh, suitable for, for this kind of drink. Agave, let's look at agave for a minute. Um, they can grow up to 50 years, right? Too much cold and rain will kill it. Uh, in March 9th and 10th of 2016, when a sudden snow fell on several thousand hectares of the two greatest agave cultivated areas in Jalisco, uh, devastating a great number of plantations and freezing to death million, millions of agave plants of all ages. Um, there's been an agave shortage every 16 years or so, going back for more than a century. Uh, and the reasons are pretty simple, long maturation times, uh, farmers who, who are looking to make money for their work. But with the decline of the genetic diversity, like any kind of clone, um, it, makes it, more, it makes agave more susceptible to pestilence and disease. Um, and, and these are all kinds of things, uh, pestilence and disease, that will accompany the, the growth of climate change. Um, also, when you, when you look at triple sec, sorry, I'm just going to scroll around here. When you look at triple sec, the other ingredient in a, in a margarita, uh, global, warming, global warming recorded in mainland France during the 20th century is about 30% greater than the average warming temperature throughout the globe. Uh, and so what this means for citrus, high temperatures alter the balance between acidity and sugar, giving rise to fruit without its characteristic acidic touch. Thus, the flavor profile of triple sec could quite possibly disappear. So the larger outcome, if we look at the fairly trivial thing of the cocktail in the glass, that, uh, the margarita is going to disappear as we know it. Um, let's, let's look at another direction. Look at the Manhattan. There's another classic cocktail, something we're all familiar with. Um, Manhattan, obviously, made from whiskey and from vermouth. 
Mixed results of climate change when it comes to whiskey. Um, some crops are doing better. Some parts of the world are showing greater yields, but in other wild, large areas of farmland showing decreased yields as a result of climate change in recent years. Um, but with global population growth expected to reach 9.1 billion people by 2050, food production needs need to be increased by approximately 70% as compared to 2007. So that means a greater drain on, uh, on the supply of grain uh, for, for use in, in possible whiskey production. Uh, in terms, uh, so I'm sorry, that's uh, some grain growing areas showing the green areas further north showing greater productivity in recent years and the red areas showing this decline in productivity for grain. Um, grapes for, for your vermouth. Um, Again, as we mentioned, the warming in France is significantly higher than, than in much of uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, and air temperatures have warmed so much, especially in the last 30 years, that grapes are now being harvested almost two weeks before their historical norm. In the past 16 years alone, eight years were among the earliest harvest dates ever recorded for grapes. And we can predict using modeling the harvest dates in the future that in 2050, in many French wine regions, the harvest will occur around the 15th of August, uh, in the core of hot times, in the core of summer. That will almost certainly affect the way wines taste and feel and how strong they are. And already as temperatures worldwide have warmed, the alcohol contents of wines have bumped up from around 12% in the 1970s to around 14% today. So if you have the hot temperatures, you also increase the sugar and decrease the acidity in the grapes, which again is going to change the character of that wine. So in the long run, what this is going to mean, um, grains in the US, corn, rye, and barley, in some places are actually showing signs of growth, but grow growing population is going to be a longer draw, a bigger draw on that grain supply, and the character and the nature of the wines is going to change, especially as wine growing regions start to migrate to, to northern, more cooler regions. Um, so that's just to take, you know, these two kind of case studies, again, you know, very kind of trivial. This is just talking about a simple cocktail, but the way that we relate to that cocktail, the way that things go into that cocktail is going to change significantly due to global climate change. So that's one way that it directly affects all of our outcomes. I'm going to turn it over to Maggie, who's going to talk more from the spirits production side as a distiller and getting into climate change and what it means for her industry. Yeah. I was really, really excited when Paul asked me to join him on this topic because having known him for a number of years, I didn't really know what his pre-spirits writing life was about. And so when I found out that he was part of a large organization doing environmental work and pushing for environmental policy all through the 1990s, um, it was really exciting to me that, you know, I had been like this punk rock warehouse kid and kind of having that connection and wanting to talk about a lot of these issues um, was really, really cool. So I'm a spirits producer. Uh, I definitely started with a uh, passion for whiskey, ended up working for Germain Robin doing cognac style spirits and then was hired by Privateer Rum and I'm their head distiller and the president of their company. I'm also a master of wine student, so I see a lot of these climate issues in a number of different directions. So in spirits production, uh, there's a couple considerations for us to really take into account. Base materials, uh, heat, water, waste, packaging are some really core ones for us to easily talk about. And in consideration, you know, when we talk about climate change and responsibility, I always feel like there's not always this even power dynamic that we expect. I feel like we put a lot of onus on the end user or our bartenders to make these right, right, perfect choices about climate when, you know, there's a lot of responsibility to be had by producers who are extracting resources in the environment for profit that doesn't fall on that end user. You know, if someone stops and reduces their plastic at home, that's awesome. We should be doing all sorts of things. It brings values in many ways. But that is very, very different than if a large production facility decides to reduce their plastic by 10%. That could be equal to, you know, hundreds if not thousands of families worth of waste. So I do think there's a special moment for us as leaders to really be aware of that. Access is really complicated and very, very important. I work in the rum industry as a North American rum producer. My boiler, when I installed it, was on natural gas and that was a given. And all of my waste goes to treatment, and that was a given. And when I talk to producers who are in explicitly the Caribbean and other areas, when we talk about progressive ideals and an ability to progress, we have to think about areas that were allowed access to progress. You know, natural gas is not the standard in the Caribbean. There's a lot of boilers run on oil there. Um, and so kind of asking about that. Impact versus visibility. 
uh, you know, what do we see? What can a spirits company market that looks good that like bartenders will find relevant versus what is less visible? And we'll talk about some of those choices that I see distillers making really incredible choices about, oh, they changed their boiler power to, you know, Don Q 2005 changed their boiler power. Um, and you know, 50% reduction in use of oil. That is really, really, really powerful on an incredibly large scale. But another brand might choose to pick something that's sexier and looks more cool and is more instantly appealing as opposed to the thing that truly makes some really, really meaningful change. Um, and then outsourcing pollution. Uh, we'll often see really big claims by distilleries saying, you know, they use so little resources, but they're not actually fermenting or distilling anything. They're having someone else do that part where the water and the energy is used uh, and then claiming these really, really great standards in the environment, but all that pollution has actually been outsourced. There's a very big issue um, in rum a few years ago where there were all these claims of environmental things going on, but it turned out they were just buying pre-made rum. So of course they weren't using the water, of course they weren't using the heat. It didn't mean it wasn't being used somewhere else and somewhere even harder to see. Um, and yeah, particularly being aware, I know there's a lot of different ways to discuss this, but you know, Global North is doing, has historically done a lot of the extraction of the resources and the Global South often pays for that. You know, they're some of the first people impacted, first people hurt, first people really who to see the hardest benefits. So who really carries the onus in truly being leaders? It's important for us to kind of look at that. So base materials, where it's from, who is harvesting it, who's working there, and who's impacted by it, invasive species and drought. So where is it from? And when I posted that I was doing this talk with Paul Clark, one of the first comments I got was, well, you have a distillery in Massachusetts that's incredibly far away from sugarcane. What right do you have doing this? And it really, really showed me how much we don't actually know about how things are made. My distillery, we get molasses from much, much closer than a lot of producers in the Caribbean. Fiji is a major, major source of molasses for Caribbean rum. That's very, very, very far from the Caribbean. Um, I was just at the Worthy Park talk and I really applaud them for having all estate cane. Their sugar is grown by themselves. And they were mentioning that last year in Jamaica, five tons, uh, five, the five ton number for what was made in Jamaica, or excuse me, eight, and then 50 was imported. So we're talking about a huge difference. It's not always from where you think it is. Um, and it can appear to be local, but it may not be. And especially with Fiji, I care a lot about human rights. Huge complications there. Huge, huge separation of people living in dire poverty situation, getting worse every day. Violent dictator turned prime minister. It's a really serious issue. And that is where a lot of sugar is coming for for rum. Ours does not. Ours comes from much closer to us. Um, Invasive species, this is a really, really big one. Um, and it was a really big one in the world of wine in Northern California. Uh, and as someone who made brandy up there, we had the glassy wing sharpshooter. It was an insect that used to live much further south. And as it's warmed, they have moved north where they have no natural predators and really, really, really wreaked havoc brutally over all of the vineyards in California, getting all the way up into like the very, very premium wine regions. That was very serious for us to deal with. There's the fungus that is attacking juniper berries throughout Northern Europe to make you know, Scottish gin. Um, I was talking to some producers about that at a recent alcohol yeast physiology summit in Montreal. Uh, these are things that people are dealing with. As it warms, these sort of issues are moving north. That's really, really important. Um, and drought. Drought's gonna be a major, major effect on an ability to produce a lot of things. Um, I, when I was studying for the Masters of Wine, I came across this article and I heard nothing about it in the spirits industry, but I heard a lot about it in the wine industry. Um, and you can see it's a couple years old, 2015, um, talking about how the grapes are dis destined for Pisco distillers and water issues there. Um, there's also an excess of water. You're seeing these hurricanes stall out in the Caribbean and people who are trying to build more cane fields, who are trying to do more local work, are putting in cane and it's getting destroyed. Uh, and obviously there's many, many more serious implications that come with the change of those hurricanes. Um, for me, I'm also a beekeeper 
and bees like grapes are very sensitive and they tell us what's going on before we can really see it ourselves. I have lost my hive every spring for the last three years. They went into winter healthy, they were treated, they were in great health, they made it through horrible Massachusetts winters. This last year we had negative 20 degrees three days in a row. They were absolutely fine until spring when there was erratic weather, it warmed up, it got cold, it warmed up, it got cold, and they died. So it's really, really affecting everything around us. And in a distillery, the source of heat is very important. Um, you know, there's definitely people who use biogas from their own waste. Um, there's a lot of people who use natural gas. As I mentioned, um, if anyone saw Don Q's talk yesterday, they're incredibly transparent and they will reuse steam, which saves reheating energy, as well as the water resource used, which is really, really important. Again, it might not be the sexiest, most visible, oh, we have this most technologically advanced, awesome solar panels or whatever, but it's the really, really important stuff. As a producer, I can tell you that is very meaningful. Um, and then, of course, oiler, oil boiler power, which I mentioned, um, which is really, really common. And it was something that really surprised me. I wasn't aware of it um, because I had been so naive in my sort of self-referential bubble in North America. Um, so what resources are they using for their boiler power? And then water. Water is a huge source of consumption in distilled spirits because those condensers that you see are constantly having a feed of cold water introduced to them and spitting out hot water because they're a heat exchanger in effect. So all day long, it's like having a faucet running. The larger the facility, the larger the still, the warmer your water source, the more water you're running out of that faucet. And so how much are you using? How much of that water is reused? At my facility, we have a water recovery system so that pre-warmed, so all the water going into our condensers is treated, it goes through, it's pre-warmed, and we use that for creating fermentations, cleaning, so we're reusing our condenser water. Um, and then what water is released and where and how hot is it? If they're dumping into the ocean, are they releasing a bunch of thermal pollution into the water? These things are really, really, really important to be asking about. Waste, um, types of waste, you know, working with molasses. Once I receive the molasses, I'm very fortunate that um, I don't have any solid waste, but when I definitely was more familiar with the whiskey world, you had a lot of solid waste. Where was it going? Uh, grapes, the same. And then, of course, your stillage is a very, very important thing. And, you know, in the Caribbean, there's a lot of stillage dumped into the ocean. Um, and actually, in Scotland, there's, I've seen that happen as well. Uh, there's limitations on what and how much in some places. Uh, and so kind of wondering and asking, where is that waste going? What is it doing? You know, they talk about spraying on cane orchards, but there's not many cane orchards. So that's much less common than it used to be. Disposal of waste, treatment of waste, dumping of waste. At my facility, we use all grade A molasses, which is much, 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 it does not have the concentration of basically chemicals in it that a blackstrap molasses would. So when you dispose of blackstrap, it's very different than disposing of grade A. It's very different than disposing of fresh pressed cane. And then of course, with different grains and fruits, et cetera, it's all the same question. And I always like to ask people, especially when brands are making claims, I say, well, how much of it? What percent? What percent of water are you reusing? What percent of your waste are you composting? You know, those are really, really important questions. Um, and one of the things I'm really proud of is our cane producer. They've helped kind of co-create this dry cane washing method. So they're not washing all of the cane with water and disposing of a lot of water uh, that's going downstream. So that's been really exciting to see some changes there. Packaging, I know bartenders, this is like front and center for you because you see it so easily and so commonly. Um, but yeah, considerations for vessels, closures, labels, how much does it weigh? What's the source? Is it recyclable? Is it being recycled? And if it's not being recycled, how does it decompose in a uh, garbage pit, landfill leaching? So there's plastics, aluminums. Aluminum smelting can be very dirty. And there's also concerns about some of the liners containing, as to my knowledge, the last I read, they still all had BPA in them, uh, Tetra Packs, Glass, glass making is dirty, um, but it is very 
if it's, it is recyclable if it's recycled, and if it's not recycled, it's very inert in a landfill. It is very heavy, which is always a concern. But there's a lot of different aspects that go into each one of these. Um, cork, I personally use natural cork at our facility. I really like natural cork. I like supporting that community and investing in those areas of the world. Um, I like that those trees live very easily through the entire process. There's no shortage of them. They're natural habitats for animals. They are definitely a carbon sink. I really like that. Uh, synthetic capsules, they could be aluminum. Again, that kind of raises some concerns, how it's being made, what's the lining made of, um, screw caps, etc. So it's a lot that goes into all of these different choices and why people are making them. And of course, alcohol is a solvent. It will dissolve and absorb the character of anything it comes into contact with. So this is a big, big question uh, in packaging. Fantastic. Now, um, there's a reason we, we decided to call, call this talk climate change and not sustainability. Uh, if you've gone to any kind of bar show in the last couple of years, sustainability has, has been a huge topic, which is fantastic. Um, you, see, uh, you see efforts like Trash Tiki, or efforts uh, at bars around the world to reduce the amount of waste that they have coming out of their bars. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Um, you see bars participating in efforts in governments, local governments participating in efforts to reduce plastic usage, to reduce the use of uh, single-use plastic straws, for example. That's fantastic. But that's not really what we're talking about. Uh, when we're getting into climate change, that fits into the overall story, but we need to look at the larger story as well. Uh, because even with this kind of growth growing concern within the bar community and the attention paid within the industry and, this, and the growing pressure uh, to act in the inter international arena, there's still governmental reluctance to act uh, internationally, in particular from our country. We're, we're taking some of the blame there. Uh, but also, but uh, you know, even 25 years after creation of the, uh, the Paris Agreement, the U.S. remains responsible for more than 25% of cumulative emissions, second only to China. Uh, but even in a time when administrations in the U.S. and elsewhere are undermining environmental regulations and rules and sidestepping international agreements to reduce carbon emissions, there's still some signs of hope. Um, a recent Washington Post poll in the United States found that more than 75% of Americans consider climate change a crisis or a major problem. Uh, in a survey this summer in Texas, which is a top oil producing state and, and politically not a place that you would think would be very sympathetic uh, to thinking about climate change, indicated that a majority of those polled saw climate change as a problem. So while this optimism is translating into the bar world in the form of waste reduction uh, and decreasing our carbon footprint, there's still a need for engagement on this kind of political level. And that's what, that's what we're looking at right now with some things coming up over the course of the next year. Um, this is one example uh, that we've come across. It was originally conceived of as the Sinking Manhattan Project. Uh, it's now it's kind of rebranded itself as Drink the Change. It's an effort between bartenders, uh, ocean and climate scientists, and environmental non-governmental organizations aimed at bringing the discussion of climate change into the cocktail conversation. Um, the aim is to take this kind of massive and massively complicated topic and translate it into an approachable level of action using the tool of a cocktail in the familiar environment of a cocktail bar. Uh, through a social media push and an online campaign, it's sharing climate cocktails that help tell the story of climate change uh, and climate change's effects on particular regions. Um, the, they're doing an initial launch. Uh, it's going to be a very specific region in the western U.S. this month. Uh, it's kind of a test run, and they're leading into it in 2020. Um, so it's going to be a coordinated cocktail week, uh, trial week, like I said. Uh, the much larger scale will be next autumn, 2020, which is interesting because... Um, you know, it, it's going to be, if, you, if bars uh, that you work with participate in the events like Negroni Week, it's going to be a similar model to that. Uh, looking at individual participation from bars uh, with kinds of uh, point-of-sale items like table tents, uh, menu teasers, and things of that nature, all coordinated around drawing attention of, of the average consumer, just the person sitting at your bar, to climate change and how it affects the drink in front of them. Uh, and it's all build at building support for change, support for NGOs actively working to, to fight climate change. Um, this particular effort uh, supports uh, Conservation International, the League of Conservation Voters, uh, Ocean Conservancy, among others. It's got some major industry backing, which is excellent to see the industry stepping up and recognizing uh, the, you know, the, the kind of threat that this poses. And part of the key of this leading up to uh, next autumn, next October 2020, is in November 2020, we have a U.S. presidential election. 
in a U.S. national election, which is really going to be kind of the, the last, uh, uh, I don't know, <laughs> last chance in some ways uh, to, to have something done. So by doing this, it's bringing this conversation about climate change and the industry's desire to do more and putting it directly in the hands of bartenders. And so um, just to give you an example, so they're talking about climate cocktails. And the cocktails that they're recommending or that they're soliciting from bartenders are something to tell a story of a, of a particular place, where you are, uh, of the ingredients that go into a drink, of animals, and of the environment. Um, and it can look at ways that the climate affects things and the way that that story is told in a cocktail. So for example, did I give you an example? No, I did not. Uh, so for example, um, let's take uh, the Thirsty Rancher, um, which is a, it's, it's going to be a um, uh, room temperature cocktail, Scoffa style cocktail, made with whiskey, punta mas, akavit, huckleberry cordial, uh, served room temperature, as I said. And, and the goal here is both to, uh, to talk about um, American whiskey, which touches upon the issues regarding grain and water use, as I mentioned earlier, but also uh, aimed at a very particular market. Um, we have a, uh, the Villager, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a spirit forward martini cousin designed to show how baby oysters are the ocean's canaries in the coal mine. And this is from a bartender in a coastal state to talk about something that's very familiar to their customers from the region, the oysters on their menu, it all, it's just kind of like planting a piece of information in front of every customer. It's not standing there and giving them a 15 minute lecture about climate change, saying here's the drink that's in your glass, here's a little nugget of information that relates it to climate change, and in that way, just kind of puts the issue front and center without being overly assertive or aggressive about it. Um, but it does have a, a larger goal to it, which is, as I said, this is going to be in the lead up to national elections in the United States. So it's engaging bars, engaging bartenders, and engaging their clientele in making climate change a central focus of their voting patterns uh, for next year. Um, so this, uh, you know, this is still very much in its early stages. Like I said, uh, the inaugural event is going to be later this month in a few Western states in the U.S. Uh, they're they're aiming for a nationwide thing in the U.S. next next uh, October. Um, and in this way, you know, it's moving the conversation beyond waste reduction and beyond eliminating plastic use, which again is all magnificent. But we need to take one more significant step forward to actively engage bars. Uh, beverage industry and and the clientele uh, in combating climate change. Yeah, so you know I'm not here because I'm perfect. Uh, you know our company is always trying to get better all the time, uh, and it was really interesting to me that one of the first things um, a peer that I really respect said when I said we were doing this talk is, "Oh yeah, well 99% of all your product is sold in your state. You're not shipping anything anywhere," and I really appreciated that. <laughs> And it kind of brought up this bigger issue where it's, you know, I feel like something is not inherently a waste if you really, really enjoyed it. And it's really important to me. You know, art, is that a waste of paper? Sometimes to some people. But uh, for me, it's, you know, I want it to really bring value. I don't want, you know, I don't want to be a snob about my rum and I want everyone to be able to drink it in the way that they enjoy it, but I want them to really enjoy it. I don't want it to be this thoughtless thing that we just throw back, you know, drinking less, drinking better means its own sort of awareness of consumption and consumption of goods. And so hopefully if someone's really enjoying it and that bottle sort of lasts and lingers with them, that is its own sort of way to reduce a lot of these inputs instead of us, you know, slamming massive parties and getting totally wasted on 100 shots. Uh, it's its own way to kind of reduce what it is that we're putting into a bottle. So by creating a product and a brand that is sort of occasion-based, drinking less, drinking better, drinking thoughtfully, we hope we bring a lot of value to that. And when we quantify, you know, what is value, you know, a garnish might seem like a waste, but also is it that first taste? Is it that flavor? Is it really adding? Is it really there for a reason? Um, and those are all really important questions that are hard for us to answer, what is and what isn't necessary. I was kind of joking with Paul when he first floated this idea that the worst cocktail I've ever had was a daiquiri with no ice and no lime. And I sort of looked at it and I couldn't drink it and I said, was this a waste of water itself? You know, is it good? Mm. Is it really, really good? So for me, my guide for you guys on the producer side who sees where waste happens in a really meaningful way, that's not necessarily in your eye line. These are like 10 questions you can ask. Um, so the first thing is saying, hey, if you don't know this information, would you let me know who does? Because you just don't want to hear bullshit from someone who was told something by someone by someone 
for me, I didn't even get real answers until I started talking to the actual producers on the ground in these distilleries, not necessarily the person who has all the PR points. Um, what's your water source and what are your water saving messages? You know, we work a lot with our um, sort of wetland society people to really, really take care and think critically about what we're doing with water. And I see people opening distilleries in Las Vegas or Arizona, and you always have to ask these questions for of anyone anywhere. What, where does your waste and your affluent end up? What energy sources run your still? You know, what's the boiler power source? Is it wood fired or is it a boiler for steam? Uh, what's the country of origin for your base material? That wording, I know it sounds really official, but it'll get you a real answer. It won't be the marketing answer. Uh, do you use that source every time? It's not like, oh, this one time we got one batch from these people. What percentage is it? What environmental and social programs uh, does your base material provider engage in? Um, how much of your production process do you do at your own company-owned facility? This is that question again of like, is a lot of the pollution outsourced? How important is the less tangible value of your product? You know, are you bringing value that maybe isn't perfectly quantified in a capitalistic system? Are you actually benefiting the community? Are you giving back and benefiting in other ways that might just not necessarily be what's on the surface? You know, is it really delicious? Am I glad this was made? For me, like that's kind of the worst thing I can say about a spirit I tasted that I didn't like is being like, oh, this was a waste of water. Was it a waste of water? Does it need to exist? Why are we doing it? Um, you know, and what are your current active plans to address climate change? Are they discussing this at their company? Is this something that they're even on board about? And you know, what are you doing as a leader in your position to work with your peers on being more responsible. And this is really important because a lot of us are really engaged in our level, which is great, but you need to like tell your leaders, the people that you're buying from, the people who are your brand ambassadors, the people who are selling to you, even your management, et cetera, you know, what, are, what is it that you're doing in your position? Because they have a bigger ability to affect more change. Um, and that's why I think, you know, larger brands who are doing a lot of really important stuff really, really mean a lot to me because they are leaders working peer to peer to say, like, this is really valuable. And so, you know, ask them, what are you doing as a leader? Put it on them. The onus is on them to use that position. And you do hear this from different parts of the uh, of the spirit of, the, of distilleries, of the spirits production side of the process, uh, that they are looking at this. Because when you think about it, climate change is going to touch every aspect of the spirits production, both from uh, the input materials, the actual production, barrel maturation, oh my god. Um, <laughs> the warmer, drier, drier climate has huge implications for whiskeys, cognacs, anything that goes in a barrel and sits there for any number of years. So these are things that are going to affect your drink one way or another, and it's going to affect your livelihood one way or another. Um, what about my livelihood? I'm a journalist. Why am I here talking about this? Yesterday, I gave a talk over at the Rum House uh, about kind of the, the media's changing responsibility when it comes to talking about the topic of rum uh, and rum producing nations and rum producing peoples. Much the same thing holds true for climate change. Um, it's been true for so many years that yes, we, we absolutely, we, re, we study the facts, we report the facts, uh, we, we provide interesting stories to people. But it's no longer a viable business approach for bars, for producers, or honestly for, for journalists uh, to leave values out of the bar, or out of the identity, out of the equation. Um, because when you see something as significant as global climate change and the kind of threat that it poses uh, to the world, to all of our lives and livelihoods, um, we we all have some sort of responsibility to get engaged in this. So um, one thing, you know, I, I've been giving talks at uh, bar shows over the last few months uh, on a number of different topics relating to values and the way that bars embrace their values and kind of take ethical stands. And really, this fits along very much the same way. Just be proactive with your values. You're all obviously sitting here in a room. Hopefully, you not just to sit down for a minute, but hopefully you're looking for some kind of information, some kind of insight that you can take back to your business and, and move forward with it. Being proactive with your ethics on that, being proactive with your values, making that a part of your identity identity, a visible part of your identity, is a big step in that way. And that can be something as simple as including something on your website or on your Facebook page or on your Instagram. Uh, it doesn't mean you need to completely rebrand your bar or rebrand your business uh, in any sort of way. It just means being open and transparent about your values as they are and about things, uh, as, as they are about any other kind of information that you would share with a possible customer. Um, and also for food and beverage media overall, I mean, we've been looking for these kinds of stories that go beyond simply, here's a pretty 
drink for you to have this summer. Uh, we're looking for things that actually affect people's lives uh, because those are the kinds of stories that touch our readers but also have long-term importance. Everybody wants to feel that their work matters. You know, if your work is putting a drink in front of a bar, uh, in front of a customer at your bar, or if your work is putting things on paper that people will hopefully read and like, um, then you want that to matter in some way beyond just the simple enjoyment of it. And this is a way for our work to matter, to, to continue giving forward, to affect some kind of real change, uh, and by being very open about it and embracing it in some sort of way. So as journalists, we're looking for these kinds of stories. And I know it's not just me. This goes through, throughout the food and beverage community. We're looking for interesting stories uh, because there are you know, things driving our world, and it just gives us something better to work with. And because complacency is no longer a viable option. Yeah, you guys have questions. We've got quite a bit. We throw a lot. There is one thing about this issue. It's really heavy. <laughs> um, and we realize this is going to be a really serious challenge to talk about climate change in an environment like this. But we want to make sure that we're getting your information and your concerns as well. Uh, because we hope this isn't our last time to talk about this topic, because it's something that everybody needs to be talking about uh, on a much more engaged basis. So we want to hear from you as well. Yeah. With that in mind, is there any questions? She's coming up the microphone. <laughs> hey guys, great job. What, what is it that you think we can actually do, both as uh, consumers, bar owners, uh, suppliers? I realize that it's a lot of tears there, but what are the various things that you think that at least everyone's listening here who's going to go and order drinks somewhere um, or have a party or have a birthday or something over the next couple of months, what are the things that we can start to do immediately? For me, the number one thing that I can do tomorrow is think about, you know, that value. Is this, if I'm going to have a birthday party, what am I going to serve? And what is, do I need a ton of junk that a bunch of people are just going to thoughtlessly consume? Or am I going to get very thoughtful things that are very pleasing and require less? You know, it's, it's sort of like have that one perfect drink instead of just we're just consuming all sorts of things all the time. And that's for me, that idea of less and better is the number one way we as not a Coke brother have control in our lives. You know, do I really need to buy this extra thing? Do I need this extra shirt? Do I have to buy this extra disposable vacuum cleaner? Or can I fix my old one? I think the less and better is the number one thing we can do with our relative power. Because not everyone in this room is exactly getting asked by the political administration, hey, what do you think is a good idea? You know, so it is hard because like you say, in this room today, what can we do? And I think that's, for me, one of the most important answers. And then hopefully those questions are things we can ask of bigger people who create more waste and consume more resources and more energy to have a more meaningful impact. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, like she said, step one, obviously, is start doing the same things that you probably do otherwise in the rest of your life regarding the kinds of food that you buy, the other kind of products that you use, the car that, that you rent or, the, or that you get into. Um, you make these same kinds of decisions every day in your life regarding the kinds of uh, values that you have uh, and then the kind of waste that you want to be contributing or not contributing to the world. So kind of incorporating that into your drinking life, if you will, um, taking that into consideration and where you don't know the answer to it ask. Start asking the questions and start being much more visible about that kind of interest. Yeah. To respond to your question is that maybe you should put at least one product per segment on the menu card which is sustainable. That's easy to offer something to the customers. Yeah, and the question of, you know, finding out which brands are sustainable, uh, you know, Montagna Rum is B Corp certified. That's great. Uh, things like that. But featuring that you find that valuable and important. Um, brands and producers, it's a strange power dynamic. But if you can show them, hey, we'll reward you if you do this thing, that can be one of the better motivations for them. They want to feel like good guys. Um, we all do. <laughs> Questions? I saw a question over yeah. here somewhere. If not, no worries. Mm, no? Any more? Yeah. Oh, there we go. A couple more. Um, I'm not really sure so much how to word this, so it may not necessarily be a question, but one thing I'm really 
uh, that goes through my mind on a daily basis, because I'm, I'm based in Manchester in the UK, is to kind of like try and push more of like a, a supportive network for people who are taking small steps, because um, I'm, I'm sure most people can agree that there can be um, approaches where people feel a little bit like intimidated. I'm not doing as much as those people and you get a little bit frowned upon like, really? Like, yeah, man, you know, you have to drop a little bit of blue, blue roll in the bin from time to time, you know, that yeah. happens. Um, but yeah, that support network, I guess, is generally just a statement, like for people who know people and help support. And I, I'm trying to reach out to local brands and, and, and people as well who have seminars to actually visit bars and help smaller and independent bars create programs and like revisit that every three months and say, did you hit those like five or six marks? Cool. Where do we build from there? And you know, do you yeah. guys agree? Like, yeah. I totally agree. It doesn't have to be high stakes all the time. Like any of this new sort of modern work, social issues, etc. It doesn't have to be huge high stakes. It can be smaller things. And I really like what you said about going back and checking in because you might think you have the greatest of intentions, but if you are not measuring and logging, you do not know the impact you are having. And that's really, really important because we think we're doing our so great, and then the actual intent versus impact is very, very different. Yeah. But yeah, it doesn't have to be high stakes work. It can be small steps. Those steps can be rewarded. And I know one of the harder things is selling it to people higher up. And I think one of the most effective things you can do is just have separate bins when I go to different wineries, uh, Fetzer Winery, I went and toured them because they are incredibly sustainable. And they just have all sorts of different bins for all different wastes. We can reuse this cork, we can reuse this, we can't use this, et cetera. Just that sorting of bins has had a huge, huge right. impact. And they're like, it seems like this big, huge, complicated, I have to change everything about what I do, but you don't. And it was really interesting when the conversations I had, they said, that when they felt like they had to do this big, huge, dramatic overhaul, they came to realize that was really about centering themselves and making it about themselves and who they were and putting on a big show and the stuff that actually mattered did not have to do with centering themselves. And that's kind of what I was saying earlier about brands who might do really important changes that aren't the most marketable, but then people are touting the marketable ones when actually some of the deeper issues are much bigger. So yeah. I really like that point. And actually, I mean, on the topic of providing support and sharing that kind of information and, and giving each other tools to work with, uh, I mean, we live in a wonderful time now where uh, b between bar guild chapters, you can actually make this part of the regular conversation, regular meetings or your Facebook group, uh, whatever it, however it is that that group uh, keeps in contact, making this a part of the regular identity, making this part of the regular conversation. And that kind of brings the powers of numbers when you go to a producer and you start asking these harder questions about production models, transportation models, you have the power of numbers. Uh, so. Yeah, but yeah. work with, work with your uh, your fellow bartenders uh, and your bar girls and your your and local groups. Yeah. And for me, it's sort of still that punk rock kid. It's always important to me, like, where is that company's money going? Is it locally owned and operated, or are they funneling their profit out of that country? Do they care what happens there? I think that's a really quick yeah. way to realize how invested they are. Oh. So. Uh, I, I think the main topic about uh, climate change in our industry is uh, we are selling something that is purely luxury and nothing else mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, producing alcohol takes so many raw materials that have to be harvested and takes so much space in pro producing it so uh, we can and, and we try uh, reuse, recycle and optimize uh, anything at the bar but still what we sell is pure luxury and yeah r reducing alcohol consumption could help the climate but i'm not in for it yeah <laughs> um yeah so for me it's it better if you're going to use that many resources you better be as careful as you can where you can and it better taste freaking good 
<laughs> what are your thoughts yeah, there? A absolutely. And, and I mean, you know, you're absolutely right. We're, we're, this is a luxury industry uh, in many ways. Um, but if we put everything in the mode of, of personal virtue of, well, like if you care about the climate, then don't drink at all because it will have, you know, if you want to, you know, cut your, um, uh, your participation in the, the liquor business's role in climate change, then don't drink at all. That's, you know, kind of an unreasonable demand. It's, it's that putting it entirely on personal virtue rather than trying to find models of, of doing it properly, doing it effectively, doing it efficiently. Um, because, I mean, you know, the, the same thing can be said true about, you know, auto travel, air travel, um, pretty much any aspect of our normal daily modern lives. As long as we put it on somebody to, to only do it through their personal virtue, then it's going to make it kind of a non-starter for so many people. Um, that's also a reason why I want to talk about governmental action and political action, because as long as you leave it up to individuals to change their behavior, then um, it's not going to affect widespread change. You need governments. You need widespread action on, the, on this kind of thing. You need large corporations, multinational corporations to change their patterns to really make that kind of substantial change that's needed for climate change. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and pleasure is one of the most valuable things in life. But are we going out and having 10 cocktails I'll kind of forget or sitting down and ordering kind of a dish I won't think about and then I'm not left satisfied so I order something else and I order something else? Or am I sitting down and having one or two very thoughtful, very well put together drinks that are incredibly satisfying, you know? And I know it's not like the sexiest advice in the world, like less and better, but it works mm -hmm. as a starting point. Other questions? Challenges? <laughs> <laughs> this is our first time taking this talk out on the road. So, you know, again, if you want to, if you have anything, uh, have any questions or any comments, please come up and grab us afterwards. We'd be happy to chat more. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maggie and Paul. If you guys want to grab them for any further questions, discussions, they'll be just right off to the side of the stage. And as usual, if you came in with a bottle, a glass, or a cup, please bring it with you. There's a bin at the end of the room and also outside where you can put your glassware and other trash. Thank you so much.